weekend. It's 6 o'clock this Saturday morning, and we have lots to get to. Take a look at some of the big conversations we've had this past week. So new national polling uh, finds President Joe Biden and Donald Trump tied in November's general election matchup. These are snapshots, but the latest uh, survey from Economist and YouGov, Trump and Biden are in a dead heat at 43 percent each among registered voters. The poll shows all third party candidates, including Robert F. Kennedy Jr., getting 2 percent support or less. Meanwhile, a Marquette Law School poll of nationwide likely voters finds Biden at 52 percent, Trump at 48 percent, which is within the poll's margin of error. That's a reversal of the numbers the same poll found in February. And in the swing state of Pennsylvania, the latest Franklin and Marshall College poll finds Joe Biden at 48 percent, Donald Trump at 38 percent among registered voters. That falls within the poll's margin of error as well. Uh, Alex Thompson, um, with Israel, uh, inflation, abortion, a lot of issues that could move voters one way or another between now and November. What do you make of these polls? Are there any trends that you are seeing standing out? Absolutely. I mean, we're really in peak choose your own polling adventure season right now. Um, yeah. But the truth is, I mean, you can find polls. You saw polls earlier this week that showed Trump ahead in Pennsylvania. But what we're really seeing over the last month is that Joe Biden has been closing that gap. And if you're Joe Biden, the thing that is really going to you know, make you a little bit more optimistic is that Trump's numbers really have not moved since the four years ago. And those numbers still mm. remain under 50 percent. The truth is that it looks like there is sort of a non-MAGA majority in this country. The question is whether or not with all of these divisions within the party, can Joe Biden really rally all those people? Can he really put down the threats of these third party candidates, Cornell West hitting him on Palestine, RFK Jr. You know, using that Kennedy name to really bolster himself? And the truth is, we really don't know. But you're going to see, you know, Donald Trump is saying, well, were you better off four years ago? What he really means is, were you better off five years ago? and is really sort of depending on COVID amnesia, which the Joe Biden campaign is, I can tell you, going to spend a lot of money making sure that people remember the year that was 2020. Yeah, nearly every day the Biden campaign is putting out something saying, hey, four years ago today, Donald Trump did X. And it's almost always a disastrous response. I mean, Joe Mika, I mean, the Pennsylvania poll certainly does seem like a bit of an outlier. We haven't seen 10 point spreads there or really in any battleground state uh, this entire year. And it's a small sample size. But I do think it's worth noting some of the other polls. There are trend lines, as we talk about a lot on this show. And right now, Biden seems to have some momentum. I mean, the race is very close. We know that these national polls are more or less a dead heat. Most Battleground states either have Trump up a little or a dead heat. Biden has been up a little bit in Wisconsin uh, of late. But there is a sense that the Biden campaign feels like they've got a lot of money on their side. And they also say they've got more votes to pick up. More of their voters are out there right now suggesting we're unhappy because of the situation in Gaza or because of student loans mm -hmm. or whatever the issue is. They think they have more ability to grow that base of support. They feel like Trump is kind of already at his ceiling. And they've said all along, guys, that they feel like those independent swing voters will land and with Biden, the more they hear Trump all year long, I think to themselves, we can't go back to that. Yeah, you, you know, Jen, uh, that Franklin and Marshall, Pennsylvania poll, uh, Franklin and Marshall, a good poll um, and um, shows a 10 point lead. It certainly is an outlier. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we have trend lines. Uh, so many polls that have been coming out since the State of the Union have shown um, so shown trend lines, and as you know better than anybody, it doesn't show up immediately. I mean, right after the State right. of the Union, you know, Republicans are like, aha, the State of the Union didn't make a difference. I, I've got to say, I, 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 as far as defining moments go, that State of the Union was a defining moment because it blew up the lie that Republicans have been pushing and that Fox News pushes every day and that right-wing podcasters push every day, that Joe Biden's out of it. That Joe well, Biden's <laughs> not coaching, that Joe yeah. Biden's not this and that. Let me tell you something. Joe Biden uh, showed America, showed over 30, 30 million people that he could give better than he even gets. He, he was on top of his game. He made the Republicans look foolish time and time again. And I guess the shock for me is that Republicans are always so stupid, first of all, to keep picking a loser as their nominee in Donald Trump. He just loses. But also, they always underestimate Joe Biden. Up until the point 
when they lose, and then they go, oh, my God, we underestimated him again. They also underestimate the movement and the in, uh, of voters on issues like abortion access and other things that are motivating people. I will say in the post State of the Union, it's important to rem remind everyone that after the State of the Union, the Republican talking point in the Fox News talking point was that Joe Biden was on drugs and needed to take a drug test. That's what they shifted to. Oh my but God. I, I remember that? I think the other yeah. thing, though, that was an important marking point that was that same week or about uh, in, the, in the week after is the realization among some voters, and this may be some of what we're seeing in a little bit of movement, although I don't think even the Biden campaign thinks they're up by 10 points in Pennsylvania, is that it became clear that Trump was the nominee. And that is something that the Biden team has been saying and will convey to anyone who asks them. They knew in advance of that during the primary that it still wasn't clear to voters. Now it's clear Trump is the nominee. And to them, that's an opportunity for them to bring people home, to, to convey to people, Haley's not on the ballot and to use what they have as a financial advantage, but also an organizational advantage, um, you know, over the next couple of months. So we'll see how that works. And Alex, one other thing we've seen is uh, the Biden campaign's doing something that nobody's done to Donald Trump. And even the Biden campaign didn't do it that much in 2020. They're getting in his face constantly. They're mocking him. They're ridiculing him. He says, hey, I won my tournament, you know, my golf tournament. <laughs> I don't think he gets yeah. it, though, when they the, he, well, he, tweeted back. He, he may not get the he mocking. He does not get it. But no. it is constant. It's mocking. And they're doing something, too, that I think, to Jen's point on abortion, absolutely devastating. They're using Donald Trump's own words as their most potent political weapon on abortion, on, on abolishing the Affordable Care Act, you name it. Uh, on Social Security, uh, when Donald Trump said, yeah, maybe Social Security could be cut, they are going after him and using his own words against him and mocking him in a way that I think starting to show up in the polls. Absolutely. I mean, as he often says, it, you know, don't compare me uh, against the almighty, compare me against the alternative. And he's making sure that everyone knows the alternative. And, you know, Jonathan has reported a little bit of this, too, um, where, you know, this is comes from the top down. Joe Biden has a visceral, I mean, I think it's fair to say hatred of Donald Trump. And, you know, this is coming, this is more than just a political tactic. This is a raw emotional dis distaste um, and, and hatred for the former president that's coming from Joe Biden. Biden. That's what you're seeing on the trail to make sure that everyone um, or as many Americans as possible feel the same way as he does. Don't go anywhere. Morning Joe Weekend returns after a short break. I read the article this morning and it really does. The first paragraph jumps off the page. Let me read it really quickly. Uh, I, I'm so glad you brought it up. In today's economy, voters' vibes battle with clear-cut data is the headline. Uh, Greg, yeah. in the Wall Street Journal's latest poll of swing states, 74 percent of respondents said inflation has moved in the wrong direction this year. This assessment, which holds across all seven states, is startling, sobering, and simply not true. Right. Uh, this is not an opinion. This isn't something on which reasonable people can disagree. If hard economic data count for anything, we can say unambiguously that inflation has moved in the right direction in the past 12 months. And then he goes and explains how things are going well with inflation, and then he moves on to the other things of the economy. Again, this is absolutely vexing that people are saying, Andrew, How's your personal situation? Oh, I'm doing great. Great economic. I'm doing better than I've been doing in a long time. 75% of Americans. And then in this Wall Street Journal poll, the question right. is, how are things going in your state? Oh, our state, our state economy is going great. Most of them, our state economy is doing really well. I mean, the majority, I mean, North, North Carolina, 64%. I mean, 57% Wisconsin voters, 59% Georgia voters. I mean, pretty, pretty darn strong in most of these states. And then you ask, how's the national economy? And it's like, again, 63%. Oh, it's hor yeah, horrible. It's terrible. This is, this is bizarre. It's not connected to reality. And the Wall Street Journal is exactly right. It's so much misinformation spewed out there that people are believing the lies, even though their right. own economic situation is good. It's even crazier than that. I don't know if you saw one of the questions said, 
do you believe that your retirement and savings um, and money in the market is, in the last year, just in the last year, is doing better or worse? Just in the last year. And they said worse. And numerically, you can look at the screen, any screen, you can look at the stock market, which would invariably show you that your retirement mm -hmm. money is higher. And yet, a majority of these folks are saying that it's lower. I mean, it's literally like, you know, telling you that it's, you know, it's, well, today it's not raining, but it'd be like saying it's raining outside when it's sunny. Well, it's rained most days, so I, it's an easy mistake to make there, Andrew. So, um, John Hyman, let's bring you in on this. You know, this is, this is one of the fundamental questions about this election. How are you feeling about the economy? It's vexed the Biden White House for months now, where they point the numbers and say, look, it's pretty good. Uh, and yet they're not getting credit for it. And as this piece points out, there's this sort of dichotomy where people feel good about their own situation, but don't feel good about it nationally, and they're not giving the president credit. Well, I think that's right, Jonathan. And part of the problem is that the, the, the economy is in a good place. And in a macro sense, that's 100% true. I think if Andrew uh, uh, wanted to tell me I was wrong, I, I always bow to him because he knows more about this stuff than me. But the, the problem is that the lagging, the, the, the indicator that has changed at, uh, is gone in the right direction, has improved the least quickly, and where still there are nagging problems is on the question of inflation, which is really yes. the, you're you know, right. the prices have, we've seen a tapering off of inflation, but, but on the question of fuel costs, grocery costs, housing costs, uh, people are still feeling it. And that is the thing that affects everybody. It's not a thing that affects, you know, whether you're employed, unemployed, rich, middle class, poor, doesn't matter. It hits everybody and everyone feels it in a very direct way. And I think that that, and, and one of the things that's been a challenge for the, for the Biden White House is that it is never a, a, a successful political strategy to tell people that they are wrong in how they're feeling about the economy. You cannot argue mm -hmm. people out of their feelings. You cannot preach to them about how, if you just understood this economic data better, guys, uh, you would, you, you would just, you guys are wrong. Your feelings are wrong. You have to figure out a way to say to them, hey, we know that prices are still too high. We know you're still feeling it in your pocketbook. Now, but look at all the progress we've made. This is the is the is this thing we still got to get after. Give us some more time because you know it's just going to be worse with Donald Trump. He's not on your side. We're on your side. We've made we fixed a lot of stuff. This thing still we need some work. We made some progress, but not enough. There's not enough of that. I think acknowledgement on the administration's part that there is a legitimate yeah. thing that people feel out in America, which is prices are still too high. Yeah, yeah but, but but Jen, if you I understand all that and I agree with John. Don't be condescending to voters and tell them mm -hmm. that the world is something that it's not. But when, when the majority of voters tell you their economic situation's great, when, when the majority of voters tell you that things are going well in their state, and then they go, but the, the overall economy nationally is just horrible. I'm sorry, but, you know, if you looked at certain cable news channels, you would think, we were in the middle of a Great Depression, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that illegal immigrants were racing through schools across America, stabbing people in the face, uh, and, and that, that, that leprosy is going to be spread uh, by migrants going across the border. It's all Joe Biden's and, fault. And, and, that trans, uh, and that trans athletes oh. are coming to your middle school uh, to beat up your, your, your you know, sixth grade girl. I mean, it's seriously, turn it on anytime. Turn it on anytime. And, and it's the economy is in free fall. Migrants are coming to kill you. And trans athletes are, I mean, it's just, it's constant. It's a constant, mm -hmm. constant churning of these messages. And it has an impact on polls after 24-7. Uh, after of course it does. I've never heard the leprosy one. That's a new one, but probably out there in the ecosystem, no question. Yeah, you have, you have not been listening close enough through the years. Migrants are bringing leprosy to, to America. Right. Need to listen According more to Steve Bannon and, 
and right wing information. I do think and I, I agree with what John Heileman just said. I think a key thing here, and I, I, I remember back, and you may all too, you all probably do, back to 2012 when Barack Obama was running for re election. I was working on his campaign. The economy was not actually great at the time, it was improving. Hard to, uh, hard to communicate about an improving economy, that things are less bad. But the message that worked was not about data. People don't vote on data, even if data is better. They vote about how they feel. Some of that is what, what the cost of things are at the grocery store. Can you buy a car? Can you get affordable housing, which is obviously a huge problem right now. But part of it is conveying who you're fighting for as a candidate. And that's the strongest economic argument. I, I think the whole ecosystem you're talking about, the media ecosystem out there, Joe, is a huge problem and part of their problem because the president has actually gone out in the country and done a lot of economic events. They don't break through. People don't see them except for locally, which is important. They've spent tens of millions of dollars and paid media, it hasn't worked. I think it's more about how people are feeling and how Joe Biden is going to make them feel and fight for them than it is about the data, which is what people continue to, you know, talk about out there. All right, uh, we want to get to uh, Tom Rogers. You're focusing on the streaming wars, which has a lot of implications on how people get their entertainment and news. And one unintended casualty appears to be a, a growing one, at least, local news. I spent 20 years in local news. And back then, when I left local news, they were cutting. Cuts were cutting and more cutting. And there was so much cutting. I can't even imagine the status of local news now. Tell us why it matters and what's happening. Well, as you saw from our discussion about Disney and the broader streaming wars, all that gets a lot of coverage. What hasn't gotten much right. coverage is what happens in terms of local TV stations, local news, coverage of local and state election races and the candidates. And what cord cutting has meant is that TV stations lose audience. And by virtue of that, we have a real issue developing in terms of local news. We know what's happened when it comes to local newspapers. We've lost about 3,000 uh, local daily and weekly newspapers over the last uh, 20 years, and that's accelerating. We're losing two to three local newspapers every week now. And that puts more pressure on local TV, both TV stations and cable news channels, uh, local cable news channels, uh, to uh, fill the void and are relied on even more for local news coverage. Up next, could the death of seven aid workers in Gaza mark a major turning point in relations between the United States and Israel? We'll ask Richard Haas when Morning Joe Weekend returns. An Israeli strike that killed seven World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza. In a statement, Biden wrote, this conflict has been one of the worst in recent memory in terms of how many aid workers have been killed. This is a major reason why distributing humanitarian aid in Gaza has been so difficult, because Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver desperately needed help to civilians. He added, incidents like yesterday simply should not happen. Israel has also not done enough to protect civilians. Strong words, the strike killed seven humanitarian workers on Monday, including a dual U.S. citizen. More than 200 aid workers have been killed in the war so far, according to the White House. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu posted on social media on Tuesday that Israel deeply regrets the tragic incident and that we will do everything in our power to ensure that such tragedies do not occur in the future. I got to tell you. I'm glad the president spoke out strongly, yeah. but this has got to stop. What really does, uh, I, and 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 Richard, it's it's uh, it just uh, continues, and uh, there there's a very powerful uh, op-ed uh, dropped in the New York Times last night uh, by Chef Jose Andreas talking about how they had coordinated their movements with IDF. Uh, they had taken all precautions that that needed to be taken. And um, well, let me just read you some of his words. They're very powerful, strong words. Um, 
He said, Israel is better than the way this war is being waged. It is better than blocking food and medicine to civilians. It is better than killing aid workers who had coordinated their movements with the Israeli Defense Forces. The Israeli government needs to open more land routes for food and medicine today. It needs to stop killing civilians and aid workers today. It needs to start the long journey to peace today. Richard. Um, Israel and the supporters of Israel, uh, which I am, uh, have been, always will be, uh, will be, would be fooling themselves if they don't think that the overwhelming number of Americans agree with Jose Andreas that this is just enough and they need to focus on, on a permanent ceasefire. They need to focus on, um, need to focus on getting the hostages home. Uh, and they need to focus on creating a world uh, moving forward without Hamas. And, of course, in Israel, it will be without Benjamin Netanyahu. And maybe, just maybe then, we can take the first step of a thousand steps toward a two-state solution. Look, Joe, exactly right. There, there's so many fault lines which have emerged in the last 24 hours. Let's begin with the the, the, the World Central uh, Kitchen uh, incident. Look, this is this didn't come out of the blue. As, as you heard from the White House, you've had roughly 200 aid workers have been killed. Also 20,000 civilians in Gaza. Put aside the Hamas fighters. Let's say approximately 20,000 civilians have been killed. What this says to me is that Israel's approach to the war simply doesn't place enough emphasis on avoiding either aid workers or civilians. And then you obviously have a question of competence here. Why is it that an identified vehicle that had been, whose movements had been coordinated was still targeted? What's going on here? Could you have that degree of uh, incompetence? So either it's cavalier or it's incompetent. Neither one is reassuring. You know, and for the first time, the Israeli government reacted. They, understand, they understood what a PR disaster the, the, this was and is. But that doesn't change the basics. This was not an exception. This was just high profile. I, I, Richard, and, can, I, can, I, can I stop you there? Because that is such a good point. It's not an exception. It shows that there has been, as Joe Biden has been worried about and warning about, indiscriminate bombing. These are the stories we know about. We know uh, about these seven aid workers, but we haven't talked about, because it hasn't made the front pages, the other aid workers that have died because of this bombing, in, uh, indiscriminate bombing in, 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 in this very tight, condensed area. It's just like the hostages that broke free from their captors, shirtless, arms in the air, doing everything they're supposed to do, and they get shot by the IDF. How many times do you think that's happened when it's not been Israeli hostages? Sorry to speak the truth. It's just the truth. How many times? I mean, you know, I, 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 crazy me. I'm actually worried about the, the future of Israel. I'm actually yeah. worried about Americans loving Israel That's as much as I line. love Israel. I'm worried about what Benjamin Netanyahu with this offensive uh, is doing. And, and we're seeing it. We're seeing it. The more the protests rise against Benjamin Netanyahu and the more pressure he feels, the more uh, uh, petrol, so to speak, he throws on the flames. It's just going to happen because he knows he can't leave power. He gets sent to jail. He's so he will, he will intensify this war. He will hurt Israel's standing in the world even more. He will get us even further away from getting the hostages home, all because he's got to make himself seem like the indispensable man by creating even, even higher stakes in this war. Yeah, look, whatever the motives, the, the prospects or the odds, of a wider, longer war went up in the last 24 hours. You, know, you had, in addition to this question of what Israel does in Gaza and how it waits going after Hamas versus getting the hostages back, and you began with the protests in, in Israel about that, the attack on the Iranian compound in, in Syria. We, you know, we can argue that separately, the wisdom of that, and I think there was some case for doing it, but it does increase the odds that now this war will grow wider, I think the chances of something with Hezbollah in the north in Lebanon and Israel go up. So what we're seeing, Joe, quite honestly, and it's tragic, 
is none of the preconditions and none of the prerequisites of a calming either in the Gaza front uh, or, or, or more broadly with Lebanon, with, with Iran in the Red Sea. The, the Middle East is like an earthquake zone with multiple fault lines. And at the moment, several of them are going off at once and they re reinforce uh, one another. So you know, you know, every once in a while you hope that out of bad news there could be a glimmer of good news. I don't see it this morning, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. So John, this has obviously drawn widespread condemnation from the Middle East, from the West, the UK, the United States. We've seen it everywhere. Those vehicles couldn't be marked more clearly. We're looking at them in this video. Those were aid workers. You have other aid organizations now pausing their efforts saying, we don't know that it's safe for our aid workers to go into Gaza given what happened with World Central Kitchen. So what is the spot now that President Biden has been in for a long time, but that was made much worse by what happened? We can talk about domestic politics. We saw a little bit in some of those primaries last night. But on the international stage, what is the spot he's in right now? Yeah, to your point, those vehicles couldn't have been better marked. In fact, it looks like from the footage of the destroyed van, one of the missiles went right through the logo of the World Central yeah. Kitchen, right there, right through the logo, and just killed everyone uh, inside. Uh, and it should be noted, to Richard's point earlier, you know, this mistake hit uh, comes a day after the precision strike that killed the Iranian general uh, in, in Syria. It's hard to reconcile uh, those two things. Yes, there's real political pressure. We'll get into it a little later. But there was, again, a substantial uncommitted vote last night in Wisconsin. That's a protest vote about Gaza. You know, it's the primaries. It's, there's a belief that a lot of those voters will eventually come home to President Biden. They're not all going to. There's some real anger there, uh, and that's not going to dissipate. Um, and, and, and now, at least, we have a moment where you know, the president, and, and this has been bubbling up from behind the scenes for a while, President Biden, frankly, is furious at Prime Minister Netanyahu. But yet, still, his administration has not conditioned sales, weapons sales, conditioned aid. They haven't done it yet. Now, maybe this is the moment that comes. This also happens just, we think, a week or two, perhaps, before this Rafa offensive, which really could be a flashpoint. Okay, I'm so sick of hearing how upset President Biden is. The buck stops with him. If he wants to stop arms sales, if he wants to stop the bombs that are indiscriminately killing civilians, he can. He has the power. We don't need him going and his aides going to reporters and talking on background about how upset they are. What happened yesterday is still going to happen. When, at Mika's conference, the, uh, the head of the Palestinian Red Crescent spoke, and she was incredibly moving. This was in Abu Dhabi. And she spoke about the difficulty of aid getting in the country period from the north or south and she described a process that was kind of like the tsa changing the rules every single day going through airport security until those checkpoints are working and aid is going through we don't need to be giving any more arms sales or money it needs to stop it needs to be conditional it's ridiculous that it's going on unchecked and unfettered and we're sitting around and talking how upset we are while we hemorrhage billions of dollars in the Republican primaries. So why hasn't the Biden administration enlisted the former New Jersey governor in their fight to beat Trump?